Hello Internet, I am some guy! And today, we're gonna talk about a game that's all about rock and roll! Yeah! Give me some cocaine and a flying V and all my- Everybody hates you when you love rock and roll! Oh, oh wait a minute. Oh, not that type of rock and roll. More of the Buddy Holly type. Oh dear, um, ladies and gentlemen, everybody in between. I guess I should get rid of this cocaine. And, uh, probably take off the wig, so... Hey everyone, um, I'm some guy. And yeah, welcome to Overanalyze Adventures. Today, I am going to be overanalyzing for your amusement, Jerry McPartlin. Did I say his name? And a rebel with a cause. Oh boy, it's a brand spanking new point and click adventure game that... Well... Let's just get started, shall we? And this right here, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between, is how the game starts off. Kind of unexpected. You'd think for a game about rock and roll, they would have some rock and roll playing in the background. But no, that's not the case with this game. I guess old Jerry here just wants to be respectful and not disturb the neighbors. So after that quiet and respectful little menu screen, we're thrusted right into a mandatory tutorial slash dream sequence. I know, a double whammy. Anyway, our guide for this part of the game is a shaman, a Native American shaman, who's from Jerry's hometown. I know, Native Americans and rock stars, how much more 50s can this game get? Anyway, the shaman's here to inform Jerry of some of the game's plot. Essentially, his hometown, there's some shenanigans going on, and Jerry needs to go home and fix everything up. Because, well, he's the hero. What else are he going to do? And I should point out right now that Rebel with a Cause does not feature any cut scenes at all. No, it's actually kind of jarring. You just go from scene to scene with a little brief loading screen in between. And honestly, it appears that it's really likely that the developer of this game did not have enough money to afford a decent size animation budget. Anyway, this part of the game does you have to play a point-and-click adventure because we all know that's a terribly intimidating genre. Essentially, this game's a two-click system. Right-click to look at something left click to do everything known to man other than look at something and for the most part it works really well and in fact this little two click system's my favorite out of all the varieties of adventure games but i'm just talking about myself now i should really be talking about the game and there's one little interesting thing about rebel with a cause i should bring up now and that's that it is absolutely necessary in this game to use hotspot detection in fact it's a big part of the tutorial right here you see Rebel with a Cause is a pretty big game as far as the areas go where you're roaming, but at the same time, these areas are surprisingly barren. There's usually less than, oh gosh, maybe five or six things you can pick up in any given area, and they all blend into the background. Like for instance right here, here's a key I need. How am I supposed to know I need it without hotspot detection? So yeah, it's absolutely necessary in this game to press spacebar and pull up the world of stars and then click on what you need to click on. Otherwise, you'll make no headway in this game. So you purists out there, that might turn you off but for people like me it doesn't bother me one damn bit i like to know what i can interact with and what i can't although with rebel with a cause and maybe masking some of the design flaws of this game but hey who am i to judge it's not like i'm some snarky internet reviewer the 3d models kind of run a little funny don't they oh boy well let's go catch up with old jerry upon waking up <laughs> what a strange dream very strange wait a minute this letter is real maybe i should actually read it So, I'm back again, in Barnet Springs, a small, sedate town in Louisiana. Was that letter magical or something? Because how the hell did he end up in front of this diner? He just opened it, and the next thing we know, loading screen, oh, he's here! Wow, that's not jarring at all, game. You know, it almost seems like they meant to have, like, a cutscene, or maybe even, like, an intro with all the people who made the game and everything, but it's not there. I kinda think, folks, that the developer of this game just did not have an animation budget that could afford cutscenes, because there's not one single cutscene in this game. And it really seems like they meant to have cutscenes, like right here because this is a very jarring transition to say the least although jerry will try to make up for it the best he can wickvaya the old indian shaman from barnet springs wrote me that his daughter luna might be in danger luna the unforgettable love of my youth what was i supposed to do so that's why i'm here back in the place i intended to only return to once i made my fortune <laughs> if at all so now we got Jerry's motivation. He wants to protect his boyhood crush. Not very rock star of him, but hey, who am I to judge? Maybe he's over groupies. Do they have groupies in the 50s? Yeah, they have groupies in the 50s. Mozart had groupies, for God's sake. 
Oh, it's Jerry McPartland himself. Oh my god, Wickvia was right. She is in trouble. Look, her mouth isn't even moving. What the hell has happened with her? Ah, actually, yeah, again, cheap animation in this game. None of the characters' mouths move at all. Their heads don't even bob. They just stand there speaking to each other like Barbie dolls, soulless, gazing into each other. God damn it, we spent our whole lives together and then then you just vamoose and let everybody down. Do you think nobody missed you? Do you think we really just all went on living our lives like nothing ever happened? Do you really think all this was easy for me? Not easy, but... Hmm. Oh yeah, you'd think she'd complete her thought there, but nah. You get control back. Dialogue sequence over. Again, kind of abrupt. Kind of jarring. But that's Rebel with the Causes theme right there. Whatever happened to your dad? It was Wickvia who sent me this letter after all. Ah, so that's why you're back. I almost thought you might have missed some of your old friends. Uh, well... Just go ahead and tell her the truth. There's no reason to be all coy about it. Like, hey, uh, your dad sent me this letter and said you were in trouble, so I dropped everything and came back home because, you know, I, I still harbor feelings for you, even after all these years. <sighs> I know, that sounds actually kind of good for a romantic story, but believe it or not, the game doesn't really go with a whole lot of depth with that whole romantic story there. It's just kind of here at the beginning, and then it just really fizzles out. Okay, Luna. I'm leaving now. Whatever. But just don't leave again. No, no, that doesn't sound creepy at all. No. No, no, it doesn't. Especially considering she says that to Jerry every time he ends a conversation with her at this point in the game. Anyway, let's go meet her daddy who's sleeping. We gotta wake him up. Because otherwise we won't be able to progress in the game. And no, you just can't slap him. Instead, you have to get him coffee. Which is actually harder than it sounds. Because you see the coffee machine's broken. And what's curious too, you can ask her for coffee earlier on. And she says, nah, I just got decaf. So, is it decaf instant or something? But whatever. So you have to ask Luna to take the broken coffee machine to the dumpster. And then once you get to the dumpster, you find out the dumpster is locked. So you have to go back inside, ask Luna for the keys. She gives you the keys. Then you go back outside. Side, unlock the dumpster and find out oh wait a minute i'm too weak to be able to actually put the broken coffee maker in the dumpster so let's plop it on the ground here and oh hold on there's some old coffee grounds in here huh we can brew coffee out of them not good coffee but we're gonna try so anyway you go back inside the diner ask for tea then you put the grounds in the tea because that's how you make coffee in this world and give it to Wigvia who suddenly wakes up. Damn, those beans must have some magic properties. Perhaps they're laced with something else. Cherry, by Mr. B's cheap rug. So good to see you. Did you get my letter? I guess he don't remember the dream sequence. And is it just me or does this guy sound like that dude from Perry Home Companion? Or is that a reference no one's gonna get? But nevertheless, the shaman here informs Jerry that there is murderings afoot in this small town. Mrs. Bitters, the teacher, Stephen Johnson, who used to work with Fred at the pawn shop, and Greg Statson from the mail office. All of them dead, Jerry. An evil spirit is haunting this place. I entered the dream world to get visions on what is to be done. And I've seen some horrible things. Horrible things? Yes. Luna is in danger. And so is your brother Bobby. Oh no. Not only is the woman who Jerry still holds a torch for in trouble, but his brother is. His brother, by the way, who will never meet, never hear, speak. Yeah, the only way we know that Jerry even has a brother is because people keep telling him he's in danger. But I've seen you too. You're the only one who can prevent all this. Me? Yes, you, Jerry. You know that my visions have always been accurate, don't you? Yeah, Wick. Especially the one that said I would lose some teeth if I didn't behave with Luna. I considered that to be very real. Ah, oh, Jerry, those were just stories I told you when you were little. To keep you from doing mischief. The 50s were really a different time. You can threaten a child that'll lose some teeth if it touches your daughter. And it's just all, hey, I'm just trying to keep you out of trouble. <laughs> but seriously, don't touch my daughter. I will break every single tooth in your body. Because what are you doing with your teeth, Jerry? Ew. You might be into some stuff. Somehow, everything is directly related to that parcel your brother Bobby gave me. I'm afraid... The Spinellis towed away the old car you lent me before I could make it home. And why the Spinellis would tow away the car is not explained. I assume they're AAA in this small town. But nevertheless, Jerry must make his way to the only other location available to him. The Junkyard. Because now we get a quest and that's get the car back because the shaman left a vital item in the car, apparently. Who's there? 
Not the murderer, I hope. Or the demon Wick by always talks about. It's me, Jerry. The same Jerry who used to play with you guys in this junkyard when he was just a kid. Anyone could say that. Right. And how do we know you're not possessed by a demon? Uh, that's a perfectly legitimate question to ask. So how are they going to know that Jerry's not a demon? Why through the power of doo-wop? No, I'm not kidding you. You have to sing doo-wop and then they'll let you in, I guess. Ugh. Do I have a choice? None. Demons don't get to choose. Okay. We're gonna sing a doo-wop with you. If you can sing along, and that shouldn't be too hard for a rock star like you, we'll talk to you. If you can't, we won't, demon duo. Diddly diddly do who? Yeah, this is one of the few times we get to hear Jerry sing. In fact, it's the first of only two times. He's not very good, is he? Oh well, rock and roll don't judge. But these guys do, they won't let Jerry in because they ain't convinced he ain't a demon because, well, you heard him sing. Good lord, that was kind of bad. So, Jerry promptly goes into town because he has nowhere else to go. Which is also kind of fortuitous for us because if you pay attention to some of the flyers laying around town, you'll see that a doo-wop star is in town. Wow! Certainly she'll be able to help Jerry. But nah, no, she won't let him in because she thinks, well, Jerry gotta prove he's not a murderer. So how do you do that? How do you prove you're not a murderer to a doo-wop star? Ho 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 ho! Well, you go to the pawn shop and try to reclaim your autographed picture of some local celebrity that you pawned. Cause, you know, having autographs from celebrities prove you're not a murderer. Hey, I'm following this logic. But unfortunately, the pawn shop's all locked up, so you're gonna have to look at it, and then you're gonna have to try to open it. But you find out, oh hey, this is a Spinelli lock. You know, the guys who run the junkyard, they have a daddy, and he's in the hospital. So you go to your excited new location known as a hospital, and you walk all the way down to the end of the hall, and start talking to the daddy of the junkyard boys. And Jerry just pretty much tells him straight up what's going on. He's like, yo, your sons, they won't let me into the junkyard because they think I'm a demon, so I have to do a doo-wop battle with them for the doo-wop star thinks I'm a murderer because she don't know who I am and she wants me to get an autograph of a celebrity to prove I ain't no murderer so I need to get into the pawn shop so oh if you can get that my sons will believe you when you say that you're no murderer or demon well no but the songsters who'll perform at Mr. Beast Club today will and that will help you yeah because only then will she tell me the secret of doo-wop after that I can convince your sons that I'm no demon yeah I must admit, that all seems logical. Really? No. Not really. After all, there's no such thing in real life. So you really don't want to hear your adventure games telling you that there's no such thing as logic. Seems a bit foreboding there. But hey, the guy's not perturbed by your demon or murdering status. He just gives you the key to the pawn shop, which is wonderful. You go back to the pawn shop and hey, the guy who, I guess, lives in the pawn shop's here? Oh, by the way, I forgot to bring this up earlier. This game has this little running gag where there's these triplets that are everywhere. I think the idea is, it's like, oh, look at this wacky comedy. There's three of the same character models all over this town constantly. <laughs> it's not because we didn't want to model more characters. No, no, no. It's for comedy value guys uh, we're just working with our budget so this guy who's one of the triplets he's like oh i'm scared of the murderer but that doesn't stop him from letting you pretty much take whatever you want out of here and yeah there's not much you can take you just take the autograph of the sam guy go back to the doo-wop star then you give it to her and this thoroughly convinces her you're not a murderer i don't know maybe this signature is actually worth a lot of money and she's just trying to coax someone into getting it for her so she can hawk it later herself because Jerry don't get it back. She keeps the damn thing. But hey, she teaches you the secret of doo-wop and it's kind of a mini game that frankly I never quite figured out. So you go back to the brothers and you're like, hey, I know the secret of doo-wop now. And you just basically click on the right line. You want to get above the line they have. It, I don't know how to explain it. But hey, let's just go listen, alright? Duo. Duo. You ain't no- Ah, uh, that's what I told you all along. I guess we'll have to give our old friend Jerry the car then. Oh, hey. How the hell do you know Jerry need a car? Because you see, never once in any of your conversation with the garbage boys do you bring up the fact that you need the shaman's car. Sorry, a little bit annoying. A little bit annoying for me, yeah, I know, maybe you're nitpicking, but what are these people, psychic or something? Because how the hell do they know Jerry needed this car when they just were like, oh my god, he's demon for the longest time and never let Jerry explain why the hell he was even there. Sorry, 
All right, we got the car, we got what we need. We go back to the shaman. Let's go get some more plotting on this video. This is the parcel from your brother, Jerry. Okay, then. Let's see. Oh, a letter was included as well. Dear Wake, you know that I went through our parents' documents over and over again after their disappearance. All right, for those of you failing to keep track at home, there's a long lost love, there's four murders in town, and now there's missing parents. I found notes on an ancient Hopi artifact in their documents. So anyway, Jerry's brother's like an archaeologist or a scientist or something like that. But anyway, he's digging up some Hopi sites and finding out there's a mysterious like demon thing that's lurking all about them. And he's scared. So he asks Old Wick here for some help. Do you mind telling me something about your tribe's ancient rituals? You're a Hopi shaman, aren't you? Now, Jerry, remind me again where this game is taking place. In Barnet Springs, a small, sedate town in Louisiana. Oh, yeah, that's right, Louisiana. Now, I understand people are allowed to live wherever the hell they want, but it's kind of odd for a game whose plot revolves around the Hopi Indians, the shaman, the superstitions of the Hopi tribe. It's a bit weird that the game is set in Louisiana, because that's not exactly where the Hopi are known to live. They mostly hung out in the southwest, and a lot of them are now in Arizona, which is not really all that close to Louisiana at all. Now, I get it. You can live wherever the hell you want. But it's kind of like saying, hey, we have a game here about a bunch of aboriginal people and their superstitions and their shaman, and we're going to set it in Taiwan. Just saying. It's a couple of time zones and a few climate changes in between Arizona and Louisiana. All right, yeah, I just thought I should point that out. I'm just saying it seemed a little odd to me. So, yeah, let's just go back to the game about the Hopi demon who lives in Louisiana. Let's take a closer look at the note your parents left me. Oh, it's a recipe, all right. This recipe is only to be prepared by the sacred hands of a Hopi. Hmm, this could be a job for me. Wow, she's just like talking off screen like that, huh? Couldn't like make her walk in, huh, game? My father let me in on many secrets of shamanism. Yeah, that comes as no shocker. He's the shaman right in front of us. Why is he talking like he's not here? All right, now let's just go speed up through some of this. Basically, everyone's now convinced that all the murders are being caused by a Hopi demon who decided to move to Louisiana and kill people. And also, it falls upon Jerry to stop it because... <sighs> Jerry is not a Hopi as far as I know, so it just seems like, I don't know, he's the only able-bodied guy that's willing to listen to these people. So yeah, Jerry's going to want to kill a demon now. And somehow this all relates to Jerry's parents disappearing. Yeah. I can't believe it. That, that, that can't be true. Our parents abandoned us. There's nothing mysterious about that. That, that just can't be. And demons? There's no such thing as demons. Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. How is this even possible? I don't know. The writer thought it was a good idea to throw up all these ideas at the same time. So anyway, Jaren now needs to find a letter that his parents wrote to him because it's important to everything. Apparently his parents knew what was going on. When exactly did his parents disappear? The game's not really clear about that. So yeah, Jerry's freaking out because he needs the letter. Jerry, come over here and calm down. Here, drink some of this tea. It'll purify your soul. And yeah, she never comes over with tea. It's weird. Why they leave that line in there? It makes no sense. She just yells it off screen and then they're like, whatever, woman, I don't need no pure fine tea soul thing. Oh, my thoughts are buzzing around. Oh, with Jimmy Lash being played, I can't think straight anyway. So yeah, Jerry's having like a hell of a crisis now because he can't find some damn letter. So he's going to have to change the music on the jukebox. Because he hates this guy, Jimmy Lash. Now, I can't say I blame him. He just seems to only know three songs. So, yeah. In order to do this, you gotta get some money. And I'll look right over here. Here's another one of the twins. Ah, oh, look how wacky. The same character model. Oh, well, he has a bunch of coins in front of him. And Jared needs to steal them. Because he's got no money. And he couldn't ask Luna or the Shaman for a quarter to change the song. Because, no. He in an adventure game. He gotta be a kleptomaniac and steal. So, yeah. All you really need to do here is you need to go mess around with this pin ball table because it turns out this twin is like a pinball wizard or something so yeah you 
use the keys that apparently unlock everything in this damn diner other than the jukebox. Then you reset the score and the triplets like, whoa, my score got reset. I instantly need to play pinball, but I'll leave my change here because I guess he has more in his pocket. Why couldn't we just ask him for change? Nevertheless, Jerry got a pile of change and he changes the song. Hmm. Well, considering that Jerry can just phase through the jukebox, I don't know why he needed a coin to begin with. But alright, once the jams start playing, Jerry cools down and all of a sudden thinks his parents are all right people. And that they must have left him for a good reason. I know, talk about changing your opinion on a dime. I guess this music really is powerful. They didn't leave you willingly. They loved you. Apparently they found something so important they simply had to leave you. It must have been something very important. You think so? I know so. Where? Tell me. Well, yeah, that's just jarring and abrupt right there. Yeah, this is the closest the game gets to a cutscene. Anywho, this guy walking up to the diner, he's the FBI agent that's been sent to this town to investigate the ritualistic killings. Oh, Wick was briefly standing up there. But yeah, these loading screens, oh my god. Not very smooth. But apparently the FBI dude walks up to the jukebox and has the same power of phasing through it. And I think he's changing the song. Or is he just paying to have this song continuously play? Because the music doesn't change at all. What the hell's the point behind this scene? Oh, well, let's hear him talk. Yeah, McPartner. Aside from the fact that I don't like your nose and your rock and roll attire, I have the feeling that... You're somehow involved in the murders. I don't know how yet, but I'll find out. Uh, wait a minute, you can't just... What I can and cannot do is no one's business but my own. I am the law here. And you? You're a nobody. Huh. So that's the FBI agent who shows up here every once in a while. Yeah? Isn't he dreadful? Yeah. That man is evil. His aura is dark. Through and through. Did you hear the cats hissing? Yeah, <laughs> you can't miss it. They always do, whenever he approaches them. Somehow, he must be involved in the murders. Find him, Jerry, and you'll find your answers. Will Jerry find the FBI man? Will he discover the truth behind the disappearance of his parents and his brother? Will he and Luna rekindle their love? Will he defeat the demon? Find out all this and more in the next episode of Overanalyze Adventures of this game's title. What was it again? Jerry Parthen, Rebel with a Cause? Yeah. All right, folks. Wow, my nose hurts. Um, well, that does it for this part. We'll pick up next part where we find out where the FBI man is. All right. See you next time, hopefully, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between.